Hey, what's going on, CNFers? Feel like doing a show? Good. So do I. Hey, it's the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, the show where I speak with the world's best artists about creating nonfiction and telling true stories, leaders in narrative journalism, radio, documentary, film, essay, memoir. Think anything else? I don't know if there is. Hey, today I bring you the incomparable Mike Sager at The Real Sager on Twitter. He of The Sager Group. He of The National Magazine Award. He of He Talks, You Listen. In episode 95 of the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, he talks about his humble start in journalism, suspending disbelief. The power of creating something in journalism as sport and lots, lots more. His collections of journalism include The Lonely Hedonist, which includes all new material, Wounded Warriors, The Someone You're Not, Stoned Again, The Devil and John Holmes, and Revenge of the Donut Boys, which features the iconic profile of Roseanne Barr, a feature that feels timely with the reboot of the show. All of these books... You can find at thesagergroup.net, where you can buy them and learn a thing or two. His collections are an education. You want to be good? You want to be great? You got to read Mike's work. After you listen to this episode, of course. I like it when intros are under two minutes, so I'm going to bounce and get out of the way. Enjoy the show. That's my, and you know what, you can add a couple years to that because it all really started late at night in the living room of the frat house on the poker table uh, when everyone was asleep and it would become my writing room and I would stay up late typing and uh, I think in those days we had these weird, I borrowed, I had only a manual typewriter, but I borrowed an electric one from my roommate who couldn't type. And it had these different cartridges that you took in and out. And there was like an erasing cartridge and a, but anyway, I, I, I learned to love this art of creation, just sitting there typing, you know, to create something is to become a God in a way, in your own little space, especially before you push the send button these days because, or send it in in those days, because it, then you lose control of it. But I was pretty sure I wanted to be a writer in college. And I even remember going to the law boards, walking and thinking, I just want to see how far I, I can go as a writer. I didn't want to become a lawyer, but I didn't know how to become a writer. So I just drifted along with the, all the pack of liberal arts students to law school, which is where people went in those days. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I don't have a big tolerance for things I don't like to do. And I got to law school, and frankly, the only thing I'd enjoyed was my dad, for my graduation gift, had rescued for me an IBM Selectric, which was a top-of-the-line electric typewriter in those days, and he had given me that as a graduation present. And so the only thing I enjoyed about law school was studying because I would type my notes at home. So it didn't, I mean, there was no reason to do something I didn't want to do. I, I found what I did want to do, and I, I think that's, that's the most rare and you know wonderful achievement you can have is is finding the thing you want to do because then you can just do it most people don't know what they want to do yeah. and that's the problem it's like i mean then the problem of course becomes how do you get to do it and you know the world i was from uh 40 years ago was a lot smaller you know, I looked around and there was sort of like so many 
walls to bang your head against, but I, I lucked out. I, I ended up in one place where I could just bang my head at that wall. That's sort of what I did. I was the the ant, <laughs> the ant who can't, or whatever that uh, old, the rubber tree plant, whatever that old song goes. But um because when you're at that point and you know you there was that that moment where you're like I, I'd rather see or take writing and see how far I can go with that you had um you know, there are all kinds of pressures to go elsewhere whether that's parental um uh, approval and societal approval yet you still chose like that you kind of had that a closeted novelist in you but you know you chose to see how far you could take it and you land at the post and you did just about everything graveyard shift copy boy stringing anything you could put together and um where did that that grain and that seed and that hustle come from that you just you needed to just keep keep going and see how far you could take it i got to college and i i kind of like had my shit together. Like I wasn't a good student going to college, but for some reason I was mature. Part, partly it was, I think, from going to summer camp. Um, I was used to being away from home for two months at a time. And part of it uh, was fear. But I sort of got this notion that my parents had prepared me well. And so when I finished college, it was their... I, you know, really urging, go to law school, have something to fall back on. And so I went and then, and then I quit and I disappointed them. And not only that, but I lied to them and told them that they had guaranteed me a slot in the next year's law school class if I wanted to come back, (laughs) you know, which was a lie. And so it was like, I had to prove, I had to prove, uh, you know, I had something to prove. Plus, what else did I have to do? I mean, uh, I did, you know, after college, I moved in with my college girlfriend and we had an apartment together. And then over time, I ended up getting the graveyard shift. And, and certainly that didn't help the relationship any. And it, it ended up dying. So I, I did kind of sacrifice, you know, my high school girlfriend five years later, five or six years later for, for this business. But, you know, I think that was one of the things of growing up. I don't know. I I think uh, there's that old Hollywood song. Is it Gene Kelly? He sings, gotta dance. And (laughs) I just always felt that way about, you know, sitting down and typing and having things appear on the page and, having that sense of control and creation. And also, you know, I think the the least common denominator of all writers is, yes, we saw our byline once, but, you know, on a deeper level, I think writers are people who kind of feel like they're special and they want to be recognized and, and they want their thoughts out there. And, but the thing is, is like, if you're a little kid and your parents want you to sing at the family wedding that's one thing you know everybody's going to applaud for you but if you're like trying to be special and st- stick your head up and have a different idea you know you better be good mm. and that's really what's what's driven me is like the love of it you know the love of the you know and and also the fact that you know if you want people's attention then there's got to be a reason for it. You know, this notion of being famous for being famous, you know, I I always wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be able to get up every day and do what I do. And so over time, I learned that in order to do that, I had to be really good at it. And so people would ask me to do it. And, you know, I think looking back over the 40 years, things have changed a bit because writing is in such an exclusive thing. So now you sort of enable yourself to do it more than back in the day when you had to be recognized as being among a elite group of people who would then be tapped to be put, you know, on paper, published. So 
you know, there was a lot of, and then, you know, I mean, every step along the way, everyone was better than me mm. and more educated and more experienced. I mean, showing up at the Washington Post, I'd never even seen somebody from Harvard before. <laughs> I mean, all these people, like they spoke several, they spoke other languages. They knew how to pronounce French words. You know, I mean, I, I, I was a pretty good 3.98 student at Emory University and I was a history major and all that stuff, but I had no sophistication, you know, at all. And there, here I was, I arrived at the Washington Post with all of these people who were, you know, the best in their field and some of whom were famous. And I had to make my mark there. How did you uh, get there initially? Well, after I quit law school in the third week, I went to the library and looked up every publication that was in town. And, uh, of course, and I applied to all of them. And then the one contact that I realized I had was a fraternity brother. His mother worked at the Washington Post. And uh, she was in the style section. And her name was Sandy Rovner. And she would be there for many, many years after I was even gone. <laughs> So she got me an interview with the HR department. You know, I go in there in my three-piece Georgetown Law School interview suit with my sheaf of clips from all the things I was editor of and my internship at Creative Loafing and all my, my grades. And, and not only that, but I was a scholar athlete. I'd played on Emory University's varsity soccer team, you know, as a freshman. And... Uh, I had all these credentials, and she gave me a spelling and typing test, and I failed them both. <laughs> um, I could never spell. I think one of the great reasons for wanting to be special is because when I was in elementary school, I couldn't spell or do math. And, um, you know, the te my mother was constantly at the school, and I was no, I was, my spelling was atrocious, and I was never going to amount to anything. Um, so... Maybe that's something I had to prove deep down. But here I am at the Washington Post, and, and I failed the spelling test. And I could type really fast, but I, I could type like 80 words a minute, but with 40 mistakes. Mm -hmm. you know, And they count that against your time. And then so the lady, and I remember her name was Wanda, Wanda something. She said, you know, I'm sorry, you can't have a job here. Um, you don't qualify. <laughs> so, you know, I did in my mind, I did that thing they do in the movies like no you know that that sort of thing um and then i went home and i started calling sandy rovner and i started calling the post more and i i got this i think she must have given me the name of the guy who was head of the the copy aides at that time and and i just started bugging him and uh, finally they called me in for a job where I didn't need to be qualified to spell or type. And uh, so I was, I got a job on the night shift, seven at night till three in the morning in the, the wire room, it was called. And um, in those days, of course, there were no computers and no internet. So the internet was uh, the AP, the UPI, Reuters, all those different wire machines that like spit out copy. Some like the speed wires were like, then others were like like the old old TV show where it was like clackly 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 and it's like in this small room and I had a I had like a 16 inch ruler and I was you know I would get all the paper and tear the paper and put them in baskets and then deliver them and that was my job but so the since we're interviewing the first thing that happened was the first night I was there I was being trained by this guy who I still know, Roger Saucier. In fact, I'm going to a Washington Post reunion um, in a couple of weeks in Washington with all the people from this era. Nice. Um, and uh, um, Roger was training me, you know, to strip the wires, is I think what we called it, and uh, and deliver the wires. And anyway, it was like it was like ten of two in the morning. Um, and I would later learn that like a little after two o'clock, you know, what they would do is the paper would start publishing at about, I don't know, I think it was about 10 at night was the first edition. And then as we, the, the night would go by, 
you know, further editions would be published with, with, up, with corrected mistakes and updated stories until you got to the last edition, which went on the street. And uh, so, you know, by a little after two in the morning, there weren't enough, enough papers left to make any changes anymore. And, you know, I would learn this all eventually as I did all my copy boy jobs and learned all the stations of the newspaper. But at this point, it was my first night. It was 10 of 2 in the morning. My, the guy who was training me was somewhere, and I was in the room by myself. And this little tiny printer we had, it was like a thermal printer. Uh, it was the Reuters machine. And it started going ding, 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 ding. And I went over to the thing. It was going urgent, urgent, urgent. Oh. And um, it's like spits out this thing. And um, that was 1978. And um, there was a Pope John Paul. And then he died after a few days. And then there was a Pope John Paul II, who was the Pope for a long time. So this Reuters wire was telling me that John Paul I had died unexpectedly hmm. and ding 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 urgent urgent so i just i ripped up the wire and i had it you know the guy had taught me you look at the dateline you know if it's a foreign story a sports story a national story whatever so i took it over to the foreign desk of my own accord and this guy joe ritchie uh was the foreign editor he's He's still around and teaching journalism. Uh, he took one look at the thing and like cursed and balled it up in a knot. And like the next thing I knew, the editor at the big desk next to that was picking up the phone and saying, stop the presses. Hmm. And it was, you know, 10 of two in the morning. There was enough time to get enough, you know, the change. And, you know, there were three or four people left in the newsroom and in including this one guy named Martin Weil, who was a, just a legendary rewrite guy, always stayed inside the office. I learned so much from him about cold calling and how to, you know, comport yourself on the phone. I'm sorry to bother you at a time like this. Mm -hmm. You know, this is Martin Weil from the Washington Post. You know, I mean, he was so, because, you know, he was just so great. So I stood there and then I went and, went to the library to get clips and I ran, I sprinted, you know, I, uh, we were, and we tore up the front page and wrote a new article and put it in. And that was my first night, you know, in newspapers. Sounds so pretty infectious. I was dead. That was it. <laughs> so I spent the next few months, you know, like reading every article that came in. I like had never read a newspaper before. I started, I took political science once and then switched to history because I didn't like how political science would kept going on and hit, you couldn't study something when it was a moving target, you know? So I, I went to history where you could pick out an era and learn things. Um, and, but I'd never really study the news. My family didn't care about the news. We never discussed current affairs, nothing. So I, I just read every single thing that came in. I spent my whole time doing that. And then it, Late at night, I would go out with the editors and drink. And then as time went on, I started freelancing within the paper. And I literally engaged in this campaign to become a reporter. I mean, I would, I would come in during the day in a suit and sit at an empty desk. And I'd go home and change into my T-shirt collection and moccasins and jeans and work as a copy boy I mean, it would get to be a joke with people. They said, oh, saw your, your twin brother was here last night or this morning. Or, and like every single time a job would come up, like I was in the union, so they had to interview me. So the city editor job would come up. I would go interview for it. You know, I did everything. This, the guy who was the head of personnel, he went into the room where the, you know, coffee and candy machines were. And I like, went in after him and I'm like, I didn't mean to corner you, but you know, <laughs> you know, asking about the internship. And I remember there was another copy boy there too, who I also met. We both met at the same freelance assignment. We were both assigned to do a story about a dart darts tournament. 
but it was like a youth darts tournament. And he was from sports and I was from the weekly. And we both went to this like 12 and under like darts tournament. And <laughs> it turned out his name was Peter Melman. <laughs> and he would end up being one of the writers on Seinfeld. But that was the beginning of our, you know, close relationship. And I remember our first summer there, we both tried to get internships. He was from University of Maryland. You know, I was from Atlanta. You know, it was the beginning of affirmative action. And we were both, you know, Jews, which is a minority in my book, but not in the newsroom. We were not underrepresented in the newsroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, neither of us got internships, you know, most of which went to minority people. And then there was David Remnick, who came in as when I when I was I eventually he came as an intern the summer I was promoted to reporter. You know, it was always a matter of fighting for the job and trying to impress and getting the scoop. And, and, and then once I had the job, you know, there were all these people like Remnick who went to Princeton and studied with John McPhee. And I'm like, you know, studied history at Emory. And I remember we used to go to the gym together and uh, we'd walk from the post over to the YMCA where a lot of people belonged. And I, I was going to play basketball and I had my high tops and he had like this thing with a squash racket in it. And I'd never even seen a squash racket. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I, I was, I was not a, a pauper, but I was an unsophisticated suburbanite from Bal the Baltimore County, mm -hmm. you know, who had had a nice upbringing, but didn't know anything about anything, you know? Um, but I think, I guess, what I did have was a sense of self enough to figure that I could compete, um, and which was crazy. But, you know, that's the gift of youth. I mean, I was blinded by my task, and I performed. Um, and I guess one thing I do have, I guess, was a talent for words. And I, you know, shoved a whole lot of work ethic into that. Um, you know, one time I, I rode my Honda 360 60 miles on the side of a road. Uh, I-95 was piled up for 60 miles because of a bus crash. It was winter. And I rode my motorcycle on the side of the road for 60 miles and found the driver of the bus. Huh. So, I mean... That's what I did. And, and, you know, I think the other thing I, I did was and that contributed to my career was, you know, all these people were great. And uh, I'm still like a lot of Facebook people are still like people from the metro section. It was really a great thing. You know, a bunch of young writers, many of whom are, you know, well known today, Blaine Harden, Chip Brown, Neil Henry, um, you know, the list goes on a lot, you know, um, and then Michael Isikoff, um, you know, uh, Maureen Dowd was at the, the, the Washington, uh, what do they call it, the star in those days. But we all had this, this football game together on Sundays in the shadow of the Washington Monument, like Woodward would be there, David Mar Mar Maranis, Marinus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'd all play football. I remember throwing a crossbody block on Woodward one time. I'm like, what am I doing? I was just, but I was like 24 and I was carried away with sports still. I think I was the only one who still had cleats. Because you know? <laughs> everyone else was like 30, 28 to 35, and I was like 21, 22. So it was a great experience. But, you know, these people brought so much more to the table than I did. But I think what I brought to the table was. I guess sort of an acquaintanceship with the underworld, you know, as a, as a youngster, I, I played in a band with older people and I used to go down to, you know, the inner city of Baltimore to go to a music store. And, you know, I met musicians and smoked pot and they were like other races and creeds than me. And, you know, it was like scary down there. It was like the land of the, of the wire, but I was with these people and I was safe. And, um, you know, I, I, I smoked a good amount of pot in college. I didn't really like to drink. So I went to the, that side and, um, 
you know, I guess when I got to the Washington Post and when I got on night police and wa Washington was a pretty dangerous city there, at one point the murder capital of the world, uh, of the country, and, uh, but I was sort of enthusiastic about driving into these bad parts of town. I was enthusiastic about driving into these bad parts of town and knocking on the door and talking to people. And, you know, it was scary and dark and there were hoodies on the corner, but I also knew that people were just people and you know, there's only <laughs> once or twice in my whole history where I've gotten mugged. And in both instances, I shouldn't have been where I was at the time I was there. So Was that job-related like, mugging or <laughs> recreational? Well, the first time was and the second time wasn't. But the <laughs> first time, Bob Woodward sent me up to 14th Street and Clifton, uh, which were supposedly the worst street <laughs> in, in town to go walk there. And, you know, I didn't, even, I only brought like 10 bucks with me. I knew I was going down. <laughs> um, and then I got to write a first person piece for the front page of the Washington Post about getting mugged. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> I, and I remember the last line, my editor says I can put the $10 on my expense account, but you know, I could have been killed. You know, <laughs> I still remember that. I, I have the clip I'm sure in my scrapbook, but, um, so that's kind of what I brought to the table. I like was young, stupid. What's that? There's a song, young, dumb, young, dumb, <laughs> and broke. You know, I was like young, dumb, and, and I would do anything. And plus, uh, I, I had a little bit of knowledge to go with, with the bravado. And, you know, I had my motorcycle. And, you know, fucking journalism was a sport. Mm. You know, it was a fucking sport. And then it was an art, you know, so I could like climb all the way up to the, you know, there's the old post office building in Washington, D.C. I think Trump owns it now. Um, but it used to be the post office and it had this, this spire on the top. And there were people working on the, on the top. And I like climbed up into it and found the people and like, climbed all the way up there and like stuck my head out and like, Hey, what's happening? Mike Sager from the Washington post, you know? <laughs> and, and, um, I mean, it was a blast. And then I was lucky enough there, you know, I started out, you know, they would say I could, I could spin a good yarn is what, you know, Woodward used to say. I, I had a way with storytelling, which, you know, looking back, I had no way with storytelling, even though I had a million creative writing courses. That was really my problem. I, I was a great writer, but I had nothing to say. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I got into journalism, because there was a story. And it was like an Easter egg hunt. Yeah, and then if you, you, if you have that tenacity to, to climb up to the top of the post office building, like, there's your story. You know, if you can spin a good yarn, let, let their story do the telling. Yeah, get, then you could get out of the way of the yarn. And that's what I eventually learned. And I learned that beginning with um, Walt Harrington, who came in uh, uh, when I, I think it was 81 or something, a couple years into my tenure at Washington Post. And... Uh, you know, he was he was brought in to be like an editor of good writers. And uh, so we we sat down together near the library and he's like, you ever read Tom Wolf? Because he'd read some of my stuff. And I'm like, who? Hmm. And he's like, Hunter Thompson, Gay Talese. I'm like, who? And um, so he brought me in the next day a copy of the new journalism. And, you know, I took it home that night and I started reading it and already at the post, like, you know, I was learning, you know, my, the night editor was saying, you know, what hand was the gun in? And I had to call them back and find out what side of the car did he walk around? I mean, this guy used to like send me back, you know, a three inch police short. I had to call them like 20 times. Uh -huh. I mean, everybody really took it to heart that I was the kid being trained, mm -hmm. you know, the stations of the journalistic cross, and I was going to do all of them. And they really kind of, took that to heart, but they also helped me. But at the same time, you know, as I grew up, year past, you know, it was like the most intensive 
grad school slash first marriage you could ever have. And I, I learned, you know, I learned stuff um, exponentially and grew exponentially, even as my hair fell out, um, which was weird because I and I grew a beard and then I started looking older. So, you know, I, it was more proper that I could be an actual journalist. Yeah. Harrington gave me this thing and it was basically the first four chapters talks about there's there's scoop writers and then there's feature writers and sort of never the twain shall meet. And that's why the new journalism was created, because what was happening was like my editor didn't would like change my two syllable word into a one syllable word and he'd ruin my lead as far as I was concerned, because yeah. the rhythm was now all off. And like the editors didn't care about rhythm. You know, they just wanted you to perform your story and get it into them. And, you know, if it was good, good, but that's something else, you know. So Walt Harrington, like, opened my eyes to this whole thing that I do now, anthropological, intimate, literary journalism. Um, but he also spelled the end of my years at the Washington Post because I became more and more sort of unhappy with the constraints of, you know, the news and news gathering and news writing, which is really, you know, along the continuum of, you know, nonfiction writing, journalism is, you know, the, the first baby steps of, of if you're planning to be an artist, you know, you know, having the skills of journalism, you know, I think are the most important, but then you have to expand. Like in journalism, you know, the average story is either, is just on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, or it's a compare and contrast. There's no complexity to the thought. There's no, you know, thickness to the paragraphs. You know, in a certain way, it's interesting because as I've come the full route and now you know, I wrote a story for Bleacher Report, and basically they're, they're like, hey, people are reading this on their phone. We don't want you to digress. We don't want these long digressive stories. We don't want all this, you know, background information. Just, like, throw it up there in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I think over the years my stories have been known. They have a great lead and opening, um, you know, to draw people in, but the ending is always much better. I mean, the ending is the killer. You yeah. know, it's like, but you have to read all the way there to get it. And I've had more recently people cram my ending onto the top. Uh, yeah. And it's like there's, and then they try to set it up in one second, but, you know, it doesn't set up in one second. It's like it took 5,000 words to set this up, you know. And so it's funny that, like, what, what started in the beginning is ending up in the end. And I think it's even affecting, you know, our traditional sources of long form, you know, like the magazines, um, because the editors are coming out of the web. And, you know, so many of the editors at magazines today, you know, started a website. And so they want the simple declarative lead, you know, or the, you know, put your best stuff in the top. Um, that kind of thing. And um, so it's, it's sort of weird that it's kind of, for me, come the full circle of, of feeling sort of rather bridled. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> like, uh, it's like uh, trying to shoehorn a feature into the inverted pyramid of a news story, you know, like get all the like sort of juicy cinematic stuff and then let the rest trail off. But that's not how that's exactly how I, I put it too. it's like, we're back to the inverted pyramid. I told Walt Harrington that in a phone call, you know, uh, uh, an anguished phone call <laughs> <laughs> not long ago. And that's what it is. I mean, am I sitting here complaining about it? No. I mean, I'm a historian and an anthropologist and without portfolio, certainly, but with plenty of experience. And I know that, like, time marches on and things evolve. Um, but, you know, I also... I also, um, you know, that's my, that was, that, that's sort of my art. And, uh, and, you know, I, uh, yes, it can be done more in books now, but it's not the same as doing magazine stories where, you know, a book takes five years as one subject, 
a magazine story, you almost do enough research for a book, like under the old regime. I used to do like a story for four months. Mm. And unfortunately, I'm still inclined to do that much work before I can feel like I've done enough. And plus, it's difficult today for me because I have a body of work that's based on work. I mean, John Holmes took nine months. Right. And, you know, and three long trips to L.A., I mean, two to three weeks each trip in a hotel room with a car with Jan Wenner writing checks. I mean, thousands of dollars to do go somewhere and do research. I recently paid for my own research trip for a magazine because they didn't want to pay for it. And they wanted me to do it on the phone. The whole story is sort of turned into a, a big mess. And that's kind of like indicative of why. How do I turn my frown upside down? Well, what I've tried to do is create a new type of story that's sort of like the length of an old newspaper feature and takes the time of an old newspaper feature. Except, you know, it used to be as a feature writer, you kind of had a week to do a story. You had a couple days there and then a couple days to write it. And then it was, it was on. Uh, it was in. And so now I'm, I'm way better. So, but I try to do the same thing and write a 3,000 word story, but you know, only spend a week doing it. You know, are there a lot of places that want this kind of story? No, but I'm steadfastly sticking to it. And I've been doing it for, you know, this website that I now write for occasionally and help to found. It's called Mel, we are Mel.com. It's uh, Michael Dubin who uh, founded the Dollar Shave Club, um, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, finance Mel as like a vanity content brand. It's uh, and I helped you know s staff it and start it up and with this guy Josh Scholemeyer from Chicago journalism circles and uh, and you know it's a great outlet. He 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 was a student of Walt Harrington at Illinois, you know, and also uh, uh, Josh was and he was also a an assistant to my buddy Bill Zemi, who you know, wrote beautiful long form, you know, profiles for a long time for the big magazines. And uh, so he, Josh believes in this kind of work. So I've sort of found a way to do it sort of smaller. Now, does it really take me a week? No, I just spent, I spent a few days with the Rock's body double, stunt double. Nice. <laughs> the rock stunt double in Hawaii. And it turns out the guy's fascinating. And, you know, I should be writing that now. And it's taking me much longer to write than it should. But that's sort of what I'm doing to make myself happy. But am I supporting myself doing this job anymore? And the answer is no. I'm doing other things as well. Uh, you know, I started my book publishing company. And I also have artists at my disposal. And we're designing marijuana products. Mm -hmm. you know, I extended my art you know, to other things um, in order to make this work. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, weird because 40, you know, 30 some years ago, I quit the post in 84. And then for like two years, I had local contracts uh, in DC, but I was trying to get into the bigs. And I experienced all the various things that freelancers experience, you know, like you can't get answers, you you working with different editors a lot, so each editor has their own process, so each story is like unbelievably difficult because you don't know how they work, on and on. But it's funny, like all the same things that happened to me as a beginning freelancer are the same now. Running after InStyle magazine, 10 million newsstand sales for my fucking check for nine months for a cover story. You know, I mean, yeah. all those things that used to happen when I was nobody from nowhere, you know, still happen today in the same way. So, you know, I have a lot, talk to a lot of freelance people and I, I feel for them. And, but you know what? It's like weird because I'm in the same exact boat. Like it kind of doesn't matter. It's always still the same. You need somebody who wants your work. And you need to be like buddies with them so that they'll give you an assignment because 
you know, you can send a thousand queries and, you know, I mean, in 40 years, the number of stories that I've suggested and have actually been bought are like probably like one and a half hands. Right. Now, some of them famously, like Todd Marinovich, like I went to Esquire four times over 10 years of that story and finally just decided to do it myself. So As you wrote that, you, did you, yeah, so that was kind of like a, a spec project then. Well, not only that, but it was like, a magazine story that took two years that I wrote as a book proposal. And, you know, so that's what wins the National Magazine Award after being nominated by magazines like over 30 times. Yeah. So I only got into the finals once, you know, but that was sort of like the, the kind of story that I did. And I think that's another aspect of today's market that that, you know, I'm able to do at Mel what other people won't do. Because I think today, most people consider long form, it has to be a murder or a crime, or it has to be some social injustice that's uncovered. Like, so many of the stories I did, I feel were kind of Seinfeldian, mm. but also universal. I mean, the, the my story of going to high school with a junior, a seventeen year old kid, like it's one of the uh, my old man story, my fat guy story, you know, the beautiful woman, the marine colonel, you know, a lot of these stories are in this the book Revenge of the Donut Boys that I've just done a second edition of, um, but very much like you know. Hache, I think you pronounce it, bought Perseus and they let this book go, which was an LA Times bestseller. And I think my gem of a book of all the collections I wrote, they let it go. Um, in that same way, it's like magazines now don't do stories about nothing right. that are unbelievably detailed. Like John McPhee wrote about nothing. You know, the Pine Barrens, you know, nobody cares about that. It's like, unless you start reading about it, and then you start caring about it because it's a really amazing thing. Yeah. And, you know, these, and that's, you know, going back to Walt Harrington and the new journalists. I mean, you know, I mean, luckily my career has been varied, you know, because as a reporter at the Post, I learned how to do everything. And, you know, I mean, I had a 15 year career as a crime reporter. Um, before I ever got to, you know, doing these anthropologies, because no one would let me do them before, unless they were about drugs, mm -hmm. you know, like living with a crack gang uh, for Rolling Stone, but they wouldn't let me do like gambling. I always thought like gambling would be a great anthropological story, like a drug story. You know, I did young heroin addicts on the Lower East Side. I did, you know, crack. I did meth when it first was smokable meth in Hawaii. You know, I did all those things, but, you know, um, it, it was Granger. At, I was at GQ, and it, I, I wanted to do a story about a fat guy because I was like really annoyed by like Snackwell cookies and all this low fat stuff. Right. You know, I started seeing stories as a way to like drill down into these societal things that were just bullshit. Like, and it's it started out really with my, you can eat a whole box of cookies and they're non no fat. And then, so I did a story about a fat, I wanted to do a story about a fat guy, what it's like to be a fat guy in a no-fat world, and GQ wouldn't do it. You know, part of it was Art Cooper was the editor, we called him the fat man. He, I think he was offended by the story, but this is where Granger and I, I met Granger, and I'm like, man, I want to do this story, but I can't get Cooper to do it, what can I do? And he like, he's like, loved it. And, but the thing was is, Thereafter, when I went to Esquire, that's the only kind of story I did, that and celebrity stuff, which was great because I love that stuff. Um, but, you know, let it not be forgotten that, you know, I've done a whole bunch of things. I mean, crime became a sort of a, a matter of PTSD I mean, 15 years of, of dead people. And, you know, there's never... You know, I sold a lot of story, those stories to Hollywood, and I'd be in a producer's meeting, and they'd say, who's the hero? And I'm like, there is no hero. You know, this idiot killed that idiot. You know, and that's why they always put reporters in those stories, you know. <laughs> so the reporter can be the hero. But I think this, this, this designation of, of long form has shrunk a little bit 
you know, in the in the years right now. Um, and it's almost like there's this certain reverence giving given to official long writing. And at the same time, there's this irreverence where everybody can write anything in first person and it can be really long. And then it's called long form. Mm. And, you know, God bless longform.org and others, but I get the list every week of, of this week's long form stories. And, you know, a lot of them are just as first person essays, you know, and that doesn't make it for me. Since I've published even, you know, I, tr I, I leave out the device of first person because I think first person in journalism is a device that's usually only used when you're failing at your job. And, uh, you know, famously my Marlon Brando story, I couldn't really get Marlon Brando, so it is about me. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what, and, you know, you can do that a few times in your career. But, you know, I don't think like every story, when, you know, so many stories now start off with I'm driving my car somewhere to go to meet so and so, or we're meeting in my favorite bar. Like, I don't really care about you. Yeah, and, and I, it, I hate when the reporter's like, I. Then yeah, I, I hugged so and so, and we met. Like it's like no, who cares? No, it's... like at the ending, like the end of the Todd Marinovich story, I had to be in the story because somebody had to ask him the question he wouldn't answer. Uh -huh. So I had to ask it. Like, do you think you did drugs for all these years because you really didn't want to play sports, so you like took yourself out of the game? You know, which is what like Billy Holiday and so many people do. They they do drugs to avoid something, you know, what they don't want to do. So, yeah. you know, that's the reason people do drugs. They want to avoid the life, yeah. <laughs> one life that they're, they don't want to have. So it's like, it's like closing your eyes and putting your head in the sand or whatever. So, so do I sometimes appear in a story? Yes. But I'm not the driver of the story. And, you know, there's other been other occasions when, you know, um, and this kind of came up recently. Um, like I went to a prayer meeting um, with the subject. He just took me because he wanted he, he needed somewhere to take me, so he just took me to a prayer meeting. So that inspired a lively dialogue about how I was a Jew. And I've known people who have actually done stories, and that became the story that these people were reacting to the Jew in the room. But, you know, that's not, that's like defies the Star Trekian, Margaret Median, anthropological, you know, prime directive where you're not supposed to fuck with the society that you're visiting. Mm -hmm. You're just supposed to observe and you can participate, but not in a way that affects the history of the society. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's a really important thing with me. So, you know, I don't know where we're all drifting around, but, you know, that's another aspect of, of storytelling that I, I think has just become confused. Yeah, There's a there... confusion with what old school nonfiction narrative journalism is good for and what's just out of the, you know, when it started with, they called us the me generation, but that has continued um, you know, and it's like the me blogging generation, me tweeting generation. Everyone has the printing press. Right, which makes it all the more important. Um, I believe uh, Walt Harrington wrote in the, I think it's the introduction to Donut Boys, um, something, something uh, quoting you actually saying, uh, you know, master technique and then listen to your heart. And there seems to be a lack of technique going and a lot of heart rending and listening to the heart without the repertorial technique behind it. So that that's kind of goes to your point that everyone has a press, so everyone's writing, but maybe not necessarily mastering some of those basics of reporting and getting, getting a more well-rounded, well-researched piece that might add a little heft to a first person piece, or you get enough research done and you feel like you don't even have to be in the story in the first place, which is what you've built a career on. Well, yeah, and it's really, really hard because, you know, this is one of the things I tell college classes. It's kind of like the reporter wears two hats. And 
or, or the, my kind of reporter. And you have to be a reporter and you have to be a writer. And usually the personality is not the same for both. Like, I don't like to meet people. I don't like to travel. Uh, you know, I'm scared of being lost due to a childhood incident where my parents put me on the wrong bus and one went to the wrong town. Oh, no. Um, yeah, and all kinds of stuff. And, and yet, you know, it's the, it's the, it's sort of like what I call the, you know, the Catholic part of my job is like, you know, if that's the neatness part when you're on your knees, you know, I got it, you got to go and you got to meet people you don't want to meet, because you're, you know, and you've got to like, transcribe tape, and that of, of your conversations with them, because you, you would listen better the second time. And do all these things that are hard work because then you have the joy of the, what I call the bowl of details, you know. And also, you know, you have the the joy of breaking through. You know, when you stop being you and start trying to understand others, that's where like my wisdom has come from. Like, no, I didn't go to Harvard. But yes, I'm wise now because I've spent 40 years listening to other people's lives in extremis. It's like, you know, in the most extreme and sometimes in the most boring conditions. And, you know, it's the doing stuff you don't want to do is the hardest part. And like I said earlier, I, I didn't want to go to law school because I didn't want to do that. But, you know, and there was no payoff for the no pain, no gain in that, because then I would just have ended up a lawyer, you know. But now, so I have pain, but I get gain, you know, which is understanding. And it's become so important that, you know, one of my collections I called The Someone You're Not. And, you know, it's the name of a, one of the stories I wrote. But so many times when I go out to do a story, like, Either it's a, a story that's on the news or it's a, a profile of someone or it's just meeting people from a different like culture, like gang members, you know, and the impression that society has of them is so wrong. Like the the Mexican-American gang members who were, you know, slinging rock, shooting people, doing rock, doing heroin, doing all this shit. They were some of the nicest people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I remember I got ripped off for $600 by this, uh, this gang, other gang member. And these women felt really bad. And so they treated me to a crack smoke off. Um, and these were all like these, these women who had jobs, and, but they were all in the crack gang neighborhood. So they like to do, instead of going out drinking, they like to do some crack, you know, together. And I mean, the, the homeboys never had any money. So they were doing like nickels and dimes. And these women were buying huge pieces of rock. And it was like, wow. I mean, who would have ever thought? And then on Monday, they all went back to work. I mean, what the hell? Hello? What? <laughs> I mean, what? You know, it's like, and it's like, so today, what's kind of ruined me, though, from this thing is that every single thing I, I he see in the news, I'm like, well, what about, what's the other side of this? Like, you know, every single thing that we get incensed about, I want to, like, I want to know, like, the, the most recent shooting victim, what was he doing in the backyard? How did he get there? The one in Sacramento, what's the rest of the backstory? It's like there's a, there's a whole story here that nobody knows and that everybody's just jumping to conclusions about and because everybody's angry about a whole bunch of other things. Right. And it's because we've piled up, piled up, piled up the someone you're not over and over again. And, you know, nobody really knows what they're talking about. And then the news media makes everything crazy because they don't tell the full story. It's like I remember one of the first crime stories I went to in Midlothian, Texas, near Dallas. It's, it's a, a town near this, what became the super colliding superconductor was built. But in this small town, 
they put a narc in the high school. It was early in the drug war, and the kid got killed by some other kids. But when Rolling Stone assigned it to me, it was being covered by the newspapers in Dallas, there were two of them at the time, as an occult killing. Like, there was pentagrams and, you know, bones found at, at sites. And I mean, that, this, was in, this was the news. And the reason the story was assigned to me, pretty much, it was an occult murder. Mm. And, you know, I get down there and, you know, as they say, long story short, in those days, they didn't have a fence around the campus so I could walk onto the parking lot. There were three guys in the, on the murder. Two of them were in jail. I ended up at Whataburger, Whataburger, whatever it's called, Whataburger, with the girlfriend of one and the, and the driver of the truck who was in the crime. And... I look at the girl's notebook and she's got, when I was in high school, I had peace signs and all that stuff on my notebook, you know, that I, I drew in cause it was hippie days and all those kind of things. She had like Slayer, ACDC, Pentagram, Metallica, you know, she wasn't in the occult. She just liked metal music. Right. And they all, that's, th this was not an occult murder. It had nothing to do with it. Yes, they did have a, um, a Ouija board that they liked to play with when they were stoned and bored. And that was part of the story. But it was not an occult murder, but that's how it got played. And, you know, that was in that, that I experienced that in 1986 or something. And, you know, already I knew that people weren't as they appeared until you got to know them. And, you know, so for me today, you know, that's really the value of this like anthropological journalism that takes time. And the same is true, could be true for the magazines that still do, you know, explorations of crime and stuff. I think, you know, the woman who just won the uh, National Magazine Award she spent a lot of time in with that Dylan Roof guy, wasn't it? Um, like, I think I read six months over six months time. Mm. I mean, so often today, the stories we get, you know, are quick react because that's what they want. You know, that's what sells mags. It's like, so it's a different art. You know, it's a whole different thing going on. Yeah, I guess the real challenge is like, how can you engineer a life that affords you the capacity to spend the time with these people and to be able to tell a story of greater depth while also being able to like food and feed, you know, feed yourself and clothe yourself, let alone well, a family. I assume some people are still on, on decent sized contracts at some of these magazines, but you know, I'm not one of them. So <laughs> <laughs> anymore. So I don't really know. I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I wanted to ask you something too, uh, in that, um, you know, what part of the countless, you know, hundreds of stories you've written about, about so many people that are either, you know, celebrities or not celebrities, like what part of you do you see in all of these people? And that draws you to them. Well, I try to see a part of me in everyone that causes me to, it's like the line you hook onto their ship <laughs> in order to tow you along. You know, it's like some line of empathy. I remember one of the early stories like this I did was for a magazine in DC called Regardies. It was a business magazine. And I, I just moved into Washington DC's hooker strip, the Ho Stro. Um, and there were like hookers up and down 14th street. And I bought a house, you know, right off of that. And um, I did a story about a pimp, and I rode around with this pimp for, like, weeks. And, um, we, you know, we kind of became friends. I mean, and so when I wrote about him, I, it was the first time I was ever asked to be on an interview show. Um, and it was Mari Povich huh. at a show in D.C. And so I come on to the show, and it's like, it seems like you kind of like this guy. And, you know, he was like appalled that I could like a pimp. And, you know, it's kind of when I learned this thing about sort of suspending disbelief, I call it. And I think that's like an acting term. But um, it's like this thing where I'm Jewish and have a, 
part black sun, but I can go and sit with the Aryan Nation guy while he's saying N, N word, K word, every word, and I can just be there with him and not judge him when I'm there. Because it's sort of like I believe that when people yell back at the television, they don't hear what they're saying. And it's kind of like the art of war. You're supposed to know your enemy anyway, right? Mm. So in order to know people, you have to drop your defenses. You have to suspend your disbelief. And you have to walk that extra mile into their camp and see what it's like. And then you walk out. You can leave without losing your soul. And I think that's one of the things I've learned. It's like I remember the Washington Post the the first Christmas I was a night police reporter, I got like these can of mixed nuts from the from the from the police and fire union, and they made me give them away, you know, because they would taint my sense of of evenness, and I would be subjective instead of objective, swayed by a can of mixed nuts. <laughs> and you know, the thing is, is nobody can fucking sway me. I can learn, though, and I might learn to be different than I was, which is what you hope occurs when you spend time learning, that you're fundamentally changed in that area. And then that area touches on other areas of what you know. Just as I see my stories, as I, I call, you know, I speak of the bowl of details where you put in all your details, dialogue, you know, information and you create like a mosaic that's a story. And, you know, in the same way, I feel like I am a mosaic. I'm like made of found art creation of all the things that I've learned. And, you know, it's like made me into this weirdo who doesn't fit into any particular group and doesn't really agree with any particular group. Um, like I, I'm not, I can't get on the bandwagon. Because the bandwagon is always too gross. It's too gross of a concept. You know, there's too many hairs to split. You know, there's too much truth. And, you know, my favorite thing I've ever heard is from Roseanne, whose show premiered last night, and who said to me, apropos of nothing, one time when I called her up, all hate is fear. All fear is insecurity. All hate is fear. All fear is insecurity. And, you know, I think that's like the exact defining of all the problems we have because people are afraid of what they don't understand and they don't really want to take the time to listen or learn. I, wa I was watching Vice and they had this very interesting segment on where one of the young women reporters went to MIT to talk to this guy who had sort of mapped out social media and as, as, it, as a and an aspect of the left and the right, you know, social media as it reflects people's political ideology. And so he made this big sort of pretty thing with the red and the, and the blue, and the red was all on one side and the blue was all on the other side, and there are only a few threads of connection in between the two, which led this guy to conclude that everyone was just getting information from their own world. It's sort of like, all of my friends on Facebook who are members of the liberal elite and everything that people complain about, about Trump and all the things that are bad about him and all the bad policies and the dis disastrous things that are going on and how horrible Trump is, like nobody from the right or Trump side, whichever side that is, reads that stuff or is affected by it. It's just everyone preaching to the choir, you know, and yeah. you sort of that's the problem, you know, and, and, and so, so, uh, you know, and that's what that's what literary anthropology has taught me. You know, I mean, you know, clearly there's groups of people in this country who are afraid of each other and angry at each other and they, they don't want to breach the divide. You know, I just spent you know, several months writing about rodeo, you know, which in Texas, you know, in Trump's country, you know, and it's really interesting to sit at a table full of women and they're laughing 
at all this stuff about Weinstein, Weinstein and all that Me Too. They're laughing about it. Mm. You know, they don't agree with it. They don't, it's not even on their radar. And the thing is, is they might be wrong, according to my friends, but they believe it. So it's got to be dealt with. It's like all these marches displaying anger and resisting. You know, it's like, what are you resisting? No one's listening except you. You're listening to yourself. And I'm, I'm like liking my friends who are marching. Mm-hmm. You know, but none of the rodeo people give two shits right. about the march. And they don't agree that it's common knowledge that all these horrible things that Trump is doing are horrible. That's what we fail to understand in our me first blogging society that just because you have a printing press doesn't mean that anyone's reading it. Yeah, and then then algorithms built into those platforms just further create the same echo chamber because you're liking the things that are... Yeah, you're just making yourself feel good. Yeah. Yeah, and then you get fed more of the same stuff instead of maybe another voice. That, right. you know, if you, uh, but in order to get that voice, it's like you have to almost like change your geography, like you subsidizing this reporting trip out of your own pocket to go to Texas and and sit with people of different mindsets. And well, that's why like, I can't, I don't, I'm like not mad. I'm just, you know, one thing I spent, I spent like, I don't know, six or eight months writing about all these Buddhist monks who got killed in, in Phoenix. And, uh, I actually wrote stories for, for two different magazines, first Rolling Stone and then GQ. So I was spent a lot of time and I, I spent a lot of time studying Buddhism. And Buddhists believe that you need to see life the way things really are. See thing, you need to see things the way they really are. It's kind of like what reporters are supposed to do, but we don't anymore. Because mm-hmm. reporters are all from kind of camps, whether they see it or not. It's like, God bless... Bezos and for restoring life to my old newspaper and which, you know, the sale of which was was approved by the family that I remain loyal to, the Graham family, because they really brought me along. And God bless the Washington Post for being this place where I came from that still has a voice. But, you know, they're biased as hell. And, you know, they're just they're they're like, you know, they're they've got like 60 people trying to bring Trump down. Like that's that's like not that's biased reporting. Mm-hmm. Even if the stories they're finding are true and like what they're doing and I'm hoping that Trump is like Jimmy Carter and only lasts one term. You know, and I'm hoping that something will bring him down. You know, I'm I I agree, but I also see like the the the, the people on the other side see you know, they're all just trying to get them. They're out to get them. And that's true, too. So it's like there's no no cool head is prevailing at all. You know, and that's what that's what's disturbing. But then again, I don't think ever in the history of humanity have cool heads prevailed. That's just not the way we are. You know, that's not who we are. Um, and before it was just villages with limited amount of of information now it's like a huge media village but we're still humans like running around like chickens with our heads cut off yeah because we don't really know the answer to anything yeah which makes the kind of journalism that you that you practice all the more valuable and it's just it it stinks that maybe that it's just it's 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 never been more valuable but it's just not valued any anymore and it's very yeah it's frustrating to be the creator of that content and the reporter of that content and then still have to really struggle to to find the space to tell the stories that might bridge those two sides by 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 the empathic reporting that that you've you know built a well there's also i think sort of a 
a kind of a knee-jerk, finger-pointing point, sort of place that we've gotten to that, you know, there's immediate... It's like, it's just like in one of those future movies where everybody at home votes thumbs up or thumbs down immediately. There's no room for, you know, the middle ground, um, the intelligent middle ground. And, you know, as I said, in all of humanity, there's always been very little room for that. You know, because 99% of humanity is just, you know, humans. Um, but there used to be some, it seems like to me, maybe it's just, it seems like to me there used to be some intellectual level where cooler heads prevailed. But I think probably not, too, because, you know, thinking back about it, you know, in history, there's always various sides. It's just everyone's like more up in it right now. So it seems like more. Right. But maybe it's always been like this. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of truth to that. Like, human uh, Humans have only been around for 20,000 years. I don't think we've changed all that much. It's just we've been, our technology's advanced faster than our brains and a lot. Of, so it's, we might just be more aware of these disconnects, but all these disconnects have probably been there for eternity. Well, we've never really, I mean, humans don't, um, aren't really good at having a sense of themselves in relation to the world. And um, because of that, people rely on religions and ideologies um, to join, which always have like a limited self-serving scope and are founded upon, you know, Roseanne's thing of hate and fear and insecurity and um, difference. And it's like, I mean, I was talking to this woman, and I'm dating someone, so it's not like I was I was trying to pick her up. But when I was doing the cowboy story, you know, we were talking, and you know, we're two like people of a similar age, and um, a man and woman, and so we're. But you know, it immediately in our conversation became evident that I was not going to be a candidate on her radar because I was not saved, and I uh, I did not accept Jesus as my personal savior. And so she really didn't want to date anyone who is not going to end up in the garden later. You know, I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I've been dating someone for seven years. It wasn't really a thing. But I think people size themselves up when you meet one way or another. And it was just really interesting. Yeah, people um, want to be in tribes. Right. And so, and that's what I've done is go seek out tribes. And I've, because I, I, don't yet possess what William Gibson advertises a plug-in ability to learn a new language. And I think it's one of his first science fiction books, which I wish I always wished I had, you know, I can't really work in another language. I I've tried a couple times and then I've written first person pieces, of course. <laughs> um, so that's why I've tried to specialize in tribes in the, in within the United States who speak a dialect of English. And believe me, when you're with the Marines for the first month, it is a dialect of English. It's not English. Right. Um, and anyone else, or with Ice Cube. Like, what is he? It's like being an immersive anthropological journalist for the first few, you know, days, weeks, or months are, are often just like they're not even speaking. You don't even know what they're saying. And you certainly can't be yourself and can't promulgate your own opinions. And, you know, you just have to listen and study and try to empathize. And, you know, people call it fly on a wall reporting in, in its simplified form. Uh, I feel like it's like walking a mile in their shoes, if you want to cliche. Um, you know, it's like, what's it really like to be a 600 pound man? You know, what's it really like to be anything that's not what everybody understands that and some great colorful crazy shit is always what i'm out for it's just like you can't make up what people do but you have to be able to be accepting and quiet enough to be there for to let it happen right and that's what still like gets you out of bed in the morning right yeah well you know in it's in a smaller form mm -hmm. and less often <laughs> but, yeah. 
but yes, and I'm always like, you know, I have travel anxiety and, you know, all this stuff, but there's always a point when, you know, when I've like reached this sort of nirvana where I'm in, I'm in with the group and there I'm the weirdo who's been allowed to be at the party and, you know, it's just fucking great. I mean, just just to be able to like know that I've gotten there, you know, that's kind of like, it's a sport, but then, you know, in a, in a larger way, it implies that, and you know, what I've tried to bring to my, what I do over the years as I've gotten older and hopefully wiser is like almost like a ministerial quality to what I do so that, you know, I'm hearing people. I'm listening to them and hearing them and making them feel heard, whether I agree with them or not. And in turn, they accept me and allow me to be in their world. I mean, people travel for that reason. People, you know, vacation to get a glimpse of that. Uh, you know, and as, as I said, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a guy probably who's less book taught than experience taught. But I also believe that, you know, most of the philosophers that we read were like 24 when they wrote that. Right. Like the same age as our songwriters writing, you know, Moon, June, Spoon, I want to hook up with you. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'll stick with my, I used to say I was a, I, I, I was educated on the curb side. Um, and, you know, in a way I have been educated into like a, a you know, understanding humans but you know having no particular portfolio <laughs> granting me any title it, yeah, Joan Didion always said some that writers are always selling people out in your in your experience you know engendering this this trust from from people like do you ever feel like you're selling people out or no that's my first my first duty in a story is to my subject uh -huh. And I never, ever, ever forget one of my tips for good reporting is, you know, don't forget that I can't remember how I put it, but, you know, it's like you're nothing without your subject. Right. And, you know, I, I mean, when I started out as a young feature writer and I would write these snide things about people and it would upset them, you know, because I wasn't smart enough or old enough to, like, understand how to really describe them without being kind of like a smart ass which you see in so much writing now, or just like tossed off, I quickly came to the conclusion, if I keep this up, I won't ever be able to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you, don't, you can't piss off your subjects. And I think that that's like, like part of the beauty of, I feel like, like the unsung beauty of my stories is I'm still friends with or in touch with so many of the people I've written about. I can count on one finger the number of people who objected to my story. I mean, yeah. I've had people say, who was that? I'd rather not discuss it. It had to do with an ensemble cast story that I wrote about um, a fire, which I'm not sure I agree with her objections, but she was a journalist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had a, I had a, I felt like she, maybe she felt like I was stealing her story, wow. um, which she eventually wrote a book about. Is that but, the story uh, in Donut Boys, the the fire, uh, the wildfire, that, and that whole like, um, mass evacuation, or is it? Yeah, yeah, which was a really great fun story, really hard to do but fun. Yeah, yeah, fucked my lungs for like a couple of years, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember. I mean, I remember one girl saying, "I was writing about these punks in D in D.C. One of my early stories, the Washingtonian, and this girl was like." A, a councilwoman's daughter and she was like living in a squad and doing heroin with these people and all, you know, it's like wearing all black in the early days of that whole thing. And, um, I guess by the time the story came out six months later, she had cleaned up her act and left and she was kind of upset. And she said, you make me seem like white trash on drugs. And I'm said, well, that's kind of how you were when I met you, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I said who you were without telling your name and everything that you were from a good family, but that you'd gone this and she kind of agreed with me by the ending. Um, but I also learned to be able to, like, have people call you up and complain about things and not, you know, like, I always thought, like, 
in some magazines, a person would write a letter to the editor and then the author would get a chance to respond. But I feel like your whole, you got like 5,000 words, like let the person have 200 and say whatever they want. Mm-hmm. Um, but in general, I don't get a lot of complaints. A, because I've had amazing lawyers and fact checkers over the years mm-hmm. to catch me on my little errors, you know, with my, especially as I said, with my numbers and spelling, um, <laughs> which I still have a problem with. But you know, I think in a greater thing, it's like, I remember the gang guys saying, you can use my real name if you want. And I'm like, no, you don't want me to. You know, even though, like, your editor would want you to. But, like, i had been in it long enough by then to know, no, you don't want your name used. It's almost like the thing I write about in my Marlon Brando story, Hunting Marlon Brando, it's like the conclusion the young reporter comes to is, you can either act like a reporter or you can act like a good, decent human being. Which is one reason Ben, ben Bradley really hated <laughs> the story. 14,000 words, you don't meet Marlon, and that's the point of it. You can be a good human being or you can be a reporter. But, um, you know, that's sort of my higher, um, what do they say in the 12 step? My higher authority. Mm, yeah, um, I think you're right. Yep. Is is my responsibility to this person who let me in. You know, I never, it's funny, I recently collected Janet Malcolm in, in um, our women's collection, uh, the stories we tell. And for years, I hadn't had much love for her because of her, her line of, in that piece she wrote about all reporters are confidence men. Yeah. And, I have to say, Janet Malcolm was the sweetest, most easy to work with person ever. And so I really like her now, despite her saying that. But I have never been a confidence man. And I try to leave something positive behind. And if only listening to people and witnessing them and hearing what they have to say and getting it right. You know, that's the purpose of what I do and the greater purpose. The everyday purpose is the opposite of what I really try to do with my stories is the opposite of Mary Poppins' famous song, A Spoonful of Sugar with the Medicine. I try to have a spoonful of medicine with the sugar. So what I mostly want to do is entertain, you know, and inform. So I guess in a way, what I'm doing is the highest, trying to be the highest level of infotainment <laughs> yeah. possible. It's like but, what you said, you know, thou shalt not bore. Yeah, well, it's like everybody, we're, comp- you know, one of the first things I learned in the newspaper is you're kind of, you're competing with like seven or eight other stories on the front page to be read, and then you're competing for the re- reader to jump with you into the, the jump on the next page. So it's sort of like I've always taken that to heart, and like everybody, like, Writing is just one form of ent- the entertain- entertainment that comes out of a huge pie of slices in a person's life. And entertainment is just one slice. And then writing is just one possibility, reading. You know, I feel like it's got to be really good. So it's got to be good because people have other things to do. It's got to be good because I'm sticking my head up and trying to act like I'm great by writing something and being published. It's got to be good just because I'm insecure and want to make sure that everything I do is good. So I outlive my youthful feelings of insecurity. Right. Um, and so those are the things I strive for in, in, in trying to do this job. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, I'm not exactly going out on a limb by saying mission accomplished there. Uh, the collections that you've uh, that you have behind are are in and of themselves, like the collections you read as a, as a young reporter that Walt Harrington sort of turned you on to that are in and of themselves sort of master courses on how to do this kind of work. So if you're willing to put in the work and read the stuff and then maybe deconstruct it a bit, you know, maybe a lot of us can be a sliver as good as you are. And um, so we, we owe you a big debt of gratitude for all the work you've done. Well, thank you for saying so. And um, as, as you and others know, I, um, my, my books carry with them a 
guarantee that you're allowed to contact me, and uh, which is kind of easy, and uh, pursue your love of writing further if you wish. Um, being a writer who works alone is, to me, the greatest thing in the world, but it's also necessary to have other people beaming into your space at times um, to want to share the art, which only a small number of us really, really care about to this much degree. Yeah, and, and uh, how can people uh, reach out to you if, uh, if they feel so inclined? Well, I think the easiest way is just uh, go to MikeSager.com and hit contact or go to the SagerGroup.net and hit contact. Um, check out my books and our books while you're there. Fantastic. Well, Mike, this has been a, been a thrill to get to talk to you at length here. Um, there's so much more I'd love to hit upon, but maybe we can have a, a part two in the not too distant future, if that's amenable. I'm always available to talk about myself and my wonderful work. So, um... That's a wrap. Big thanks to Mike Sager for spending time on the podcast. He is at the Real Sager on Twitter. Be sure to give him a follow, drop him a line, and buy his books. They will not disappoint. Show notes are at brendanomera.com. There, you can sign up for my monthly reading list newsletter. I recommend four books and give you links to what you might have missed from the world of the podcast. Once a month, no spam, you can't beat it. Consider subscribing to the podcast if you don't already, and share it with a friend. Just like passing a note in class, only no teacher is going to bust you and send you to that crusty vice principal's office. That crusty VP. Also, I'd love if you took a few seconds and left a rating or a review on iTunes. It'll help create a greater sense of visibility in our little corner of the internet as we look to build a community around telling true stories. High fives to all of those who choose to do so. This show was produced by me, Brendan O'Mara, at Brendan O'Mara on Twitter and Instagram. The podcast is at CNF Pod on Twitter and at CNF Podcast on Facebook. I'd love to hear from you. Of course I asked my wife if I was doing a good job on the podcast. I, I sat her down and I said, listen, am I doing an okay job on the show? No! Just, uh, just not won't crack. Have a CNF and great week.